What makes a character descend into madness? Ever since Taxi Driver hit screens, there have been a lot of what could be considered loner movies, about characters in isolation losing their mind and then taking action. What's strange is that, despite the content being disturbing, the movies can be huge successes and the characters become iconic, perhaps resonating with audiences due to the time it was made, the relatable character struggles, or the style and art direction. But given there are so many ways you could get it wrong, how does cinema often get it right? Whether it be Scorsese, Aronofsky, or Kubrick, I've noticed 12 common trends that if you ever wanted to write or produce a story like this, that you should be aware of, as it seems like this formula tends to work. Each story will usually hit some of these notes, but not all of them. Number 1. The Goal Each of these characters have a goal. Maybe it's keeping the streets clean or standing up for the financially squeezed little guy. Sometimes it's a very simple, even peaceful goal. I'm outlining a new writing project, and uh, five months of peace is just what I want. In The Machinist, Trevor just wants to go to sleep. In Fatal Attraction, Alex just wants a committed relationship. And in Mother, she just wants to give birth in peace. But often this goal involves validation from other people. In The King of Comedy and Joker, Rupert and Arthur want to be accepted as stand-up comedians. In Black Swan, Nina wants to let go of her sense of control to give the perfect ballet performance. In Requiem for a Dream, Sarah just wants to be on a television game show. It's usually an honest goal, and the characters try to go about getting it in an honest way. However, despite there being nothing wrong with the goal, there is something a bit wrong with the character from the offset. For instance, Travis Bickle is a marine that suffers from PTSD, Arthur Fleck has mental problems, and Nina is vomiting just to stay thin. But there are key themes for the characters that run constantly, like that they can't sleep. I can't sleep nights. I haven't slept in a year. Still live with their mothers, and they're lonely. Even if they're surrounded by people, they just can't quite connect. This creates a physically or mentally isolating environment, which exacerbates matters. For example, Rupert Pupkin struggles to accept rejection in an industry based on rejection. Nina is surrounded by other dancers who resent her for getting the role. And Travis Bickle drives alone at night, so he only sees the darker side of humanity, the things most people shield themselves from. This is why Scorsese shoots a lot from the taxi's perspective, so we see what he sees. Next is the character's intense relationship with media and its core messaging. Because these characters are often marginalized, undervalued, and ignored, in lieu of real relationships, they feel safer in isolation, consuming media, where they often find a friend, father figure, or a love interest through the TV, which feels more intimate to them than the real world. Often these characters want to feel seen and heard, as if achieving their goal will validate that everything will be okay from that point on, as the media often portrays things as perfect, and the characters want to be a part of that world, rather than our imperfect world. This person makes them feel a part of society, and that they will be successful one day, if they just work hard and believe in themselves. However, due to their problems or slightly off personality, how they go about getting their goal creates conflict. There's a collision with their ideals or how they believe the world should work and actual reality. I'm not gonna be ignored, Dan. I wouldn't go through this. I wouldn't take one minute of your time if I wasn't absolutely convinced that I'm dynamite. I'll give you 50 cents, you give me 50 cents change. <laughs> no way. Yes, way. We see this in The King of Comedy, where Rupert Pupkin is the living embodiment of messages like dream big, dress for the job you want, not the job you have, and don't take no for an answer. These are all media tips for how to think and act in the real world, but it's not working. For Arthur Fleck, he studies what people find funny very closely, but when he tries it himself, he fails. William Foster tries to play along with the rules of society and be a good worker and consumer, but can't seem to get ahead. Jack puts himself in isolation to write his novel, but the words still don't come. And Alex has a perfect romantic weekend with Dan, but he refuses to keep seeing her. What creates the confusion and subsequent animosity is when society fails to live up to its promise that if you take certain chances, you will get positive outcomes. The characters are then rewarded for feeding into their worst impulses. Sarah is celebrated by her friends as she submits her game show application. Alex only gets more time and sympathy from Dan when she hurts herself. 
Rupert gets more time with his comedy hero when he forces his way into his car. Arthur Fleck and Travis Bickle had been carrying weapons in case something ever happened to them, and when they found themselves in a situation they could use it, they both lash out. These are usually morally ambiguous acts that are justifiable. Arthur was being attacked and Travis was preventing a robbery. But because there are no negative consequences, this opens up the mental door to more of this behavior moving forward. Next is creating sympathy for the character by having them lose. They can't have their goal no matter how much they try. They lose their job or relationships and are slipping through the cracks and no one is helping. This is every audience member's worst nightmare, as we can all relate to the potential spiral of failure that could occur with the right set of circumstances. Because the characters have no support system, the goal becomes the only thing that matters, and they become more desperate. Then starts the physical decay. Now that the characters are denied their goals, they let go of their basic survival instincts. They can't sleep or don't want to eat. They're cracking up bit by bit. They spend a lot of time looking into mirrors, where we start to see a physical transformation taking place, as if their old identity has been so rejected that it's disappearing before our eyes. The physical decay is captured differently by different directors. Kubrick shoots long takes of Jack staring out windows with eerie music to show his disconnection from those around him. Brad Anderson had Christian Bale lose a disturbing amount of weight for The Machinist. Aronofsky focuses on time passing, with quick cuts and close-up shots of the clock ticking and popping pills, as well as a time lapse in the enclosed apartment itself to show the repetition of the same destructive cycle. Time becomes harder to track as the characters appear to be living in a mental prison of routine and isolation. But humans are social creatures, so they maintain a social life by having fake conversations in their imagination but now the voices they listen to are more damaged as it's all being channeled through them. Well, then who the hell else are you talking to? Talking to me? Well, I'm the only one here. They develop a love-hate relationship with themselves, as if they're their own best friend and worst enemy. Oftentimes, instead of finding themselves tragic, they begin to find it funny to soothe the pain. So you can expect to hear a lot of maniacal laughter on the path to madness. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> this is where the delusions kick in and reality blurs. It becomes harder to tell if the people in their life are real or imaginary. For example, Sarah is so starved of food that she starts having a terrifying relationship with her refrigerator. And because she has spent so much time imagining what it will be like to finally be on TV, the lines between television and reality blur. Jack couldn't handle the isolation so much that now he embraces the hotel party guests just to have people around. But for most, we see these delusions develop with their relationship with the mirror, as the mirror is a clear physical manifestation of their relationship with themselves. Number 10, The Last Straw. The person they have projected their savior complex onto falls short or rejects them, resulting in public humiliation. We see this in Taxi Driver when Travis loses Betsy, someone he thought of as an angelic figure somehow floating through this hellscape. Or when Rupert gets kicked out of Jerry Langford's office and home. Or when Arthur finally gets the attention of his father figure on TV, but only so he can mock him. Being rejected by the people you thought were different, the people you thought you could trust, pushes them over the edge. And now they have no reason to hold back. This results in the characters truly shedding their identity. The role or goal is more important to them now, as they feel so low about themselves. A full transformation takes place, usually involving a haircut, makeup, an outfit, or a name. I'm the king. What? The king. Can you introduce me as Joker? If they can't be who they want to be, or no one wants them as they are, then they'll become something else, usually something worse. Better to be king for a night than schmuck for a lifetime. And finally, the inevitable. All of this culminates in the final act, where the characters choose to sacrifice their life for their goal, expecting to either die or go to prison, as nothing else matters to them anymore. It's all about sending a message and being remembered for doing something, so their voice is finally heard and no one can ignore them anymore. Although their descent seemed avoidable at the start of the story, gradually their isolation grew and their options shrank, and they found a way of justifying their actions every step of the way. And because we view the story from their perspective, we can almost justify it too, 
We can sometimes see parts of ourselves in these characters, a cautionary tale of the chain of events that can lead to your own psychological demise. As Heath Ledger's Joker stated in The Dark Knight, madness is a lot like gravity. All it takes is a little push. So those are the most successful examples of how cinema portrays the descent into madness. But did I miss out on anything? And which movie do you think did it best? If you do enjoy this channel, I must encourage you, yes you, person listening to this, to join my new Patreon community. Making videos is very time consuming, and despite qualifying as fair use for review, criticism, and commentary, my videos about Joker, Tarantino, Hannibal Lecter, Goodwill Hunting, and comedy sequels still got copyright claimed, meaning all the work that went into producing those essays was for free. So consider becoming a part of this community and help me to grow this thing. I want to make the content, and you want to watch it. So if you can join, please do, because I'm planning on making new videos for you every Wednesday moving forward. 